Well, I'm excited to get back into our study with you here in the book of Colossians. And I don't know about you, but just as we've been walking through uh, just these sessions, it has been such a deep encouragement and exhortation to my own soul. Uh, We've been in chapter 3. Last time we looked very specifically at verses 1 through 11 and was getting into the very practical reality of this section. And uh, what I'd like to do is just as a reminder, look at the context uh, with you. Again, the whole context of the book is focused on the fact that Jesus is to be preeminent, that he is to have first place in every area and arena of our lives. And as we looked at last time, As Paul gets into chapter 3, he's talking about what does that look like practically in our lives. And so I'm calling chapter 3 and chapter 4 the preeminence of Christ practically lived. And in verses 1 through 17, we're talking specifically about the inner life of what that means to have Christ be in the very insides of who we are. Last time we looked at that in terms of the personal aspects uh, or those personal area, the heart areas of our lives. And what I'd like to do this time is look at the relational side of the inner life. In other words, those things that actually affect the people around us, but that are on the insides of who we are. Now, what I'd like to do is just read the entire section with you, uh, starting in verse 1 and going all the way through verse 17. So this will cover all the stuff we talked about in the last session, uh, as well as this passage. But because it's one main chunk, I just want to set it before us as we uh, dive into the passage. So this is what Paul says, Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He writes, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also lay them all aside, wrath, anger, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with its evil practices." And having put on the new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, free, slave and free man. But Christ is all and in all. And then here's the passage that we're diving in today. Starting uh, in verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and graciously forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. Above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What an incredible passage. Uh, In the last Uh, session together in the last study, uh, we were looking at verses 1 through 11, and we looked at three key concepts or ideas. We looked at this idea of to seek and to set, that we are to seek the things above, that we are to set our minds on the Lord. We dived in that section about slaying that selfish part of who we are, that all that immorality, all that impurity, all that selfishness, all the anger and wrath and malice that is often in our hearts that needs to be removed, that that should not define us as believers. And then we looked at this idea of the put off and the put on. Again, there was this idea that uh, whatever is not of Christ, that I am to remove that like an overcoat, and I am to throw that off of my life. In fact, I should just throw it as far away from my life as feasibly possible. And I am to put on a brand new reality which is Jesus himself, that he is, as Isaiah reminds us, he is our robe of righteousness that we are to put on. 
So Paul says, hey, you are to take off everything that doesn't look like Jesus, everything that doesn't look like his character, and you are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I just love that idea. So as we get into our passage today, Paul is kind of continuing that idea, and he says, so because you have put on Jesus Christ, because you are wearing Jesus, because he is that robe of righteousness in our lives, therefore put on, and he gives another list of things that we are to be wearing. So again, this is not like a Jesus plus something. Really, everything we're going to be talking about today is the reality of Christ in our lives. So you got to get the emphasis here. Paul, in verses 1 through 11, is saying, hey, take off the former way of living. Hey, take off that worldly mindset. Take off all that selfishness and put it to death. It should not be marking our lives. Instead, what what should define us? What should mark us as believers? Jesus. And if Jesus, in fact, does define our lives, Paul says, well, then there's, there's certain attributes or aspects that your life should reflect because you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Uh, most of us know Romans eight twenty eight, and it's a favorite passage of all of ours. But most of us don't know verse 29, the verse that follows. But let me just read both of those verses because I think they're just a rich enunciation of the same concept. Paul says in Romans eight twenty eight and verse 29, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then here's verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you hear what Paul's saying? He's saying that God is using all things in your life for his purpose and his plan. But what is his purpose and his plan? Well, in verse 29, he tells us it is to conform us to the image of Christ. I love that word conform. And I, and I keep bringing this up because it is such a rich analogy, at least for my life. And you know, when you're a little kid, or maybe when you're an adult, uh, you play with Play-Doh. And one of the neat things about Play-Doh is if you have those molds, you know, those little plastic shapes or whatever. And you take the Play-Doh and you shove it into the mold. And whatever doesn't fit into the mold, you kind of cut away. And as you pull the Play-Doh out of that mold, the Play-Doh is now conformed to the image of that mold. That's kind of the idea in a 21st century illustration of what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8. He says, you know what God is doing? He's taking everything in your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he's shoving you into a mold called Jesus, that you are to look like Jesus, that that his character and his nature is to really mark your life, that you are to, you are called unto godliness and Christ likeness. And as such, anything that doesn't fit within that, throw it off, cut it away, just remove it as what Paul's been saying in our passage. And again, what is the whole purpose of this? It is so that we might be conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. That when the world looks at your life, they don't just see you, they see the reality of Christ within you. That is the grand mystery of this gospel, that we get to be representations of Jesus to our world. So think about, again, what Paul is saying in terms of the flow of our context. He says that, hey, you've been transferred from the domain of darkness, as he says in chapter 1, and brought into the kingdom of the beloved Son. And as such, hey, anything that is of the kingdom of darkness, anything that is marked by the world, anything that doesn't look like Jesus, you are to remove it from your life, and it should not mark, define, or be a part of your existence. Well, what should my life look like? Paul says, oh, it should look like Jesus. Would you get wrapped up in Jesus? Hey, would you just let him be the focus? Would you let him be preeminent? Would you let him have first place in every arena and area of your life? So as such, here are some things that your life should look like. So let's dive into this. Paul, again, in in Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13 says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Now pause right there for just a second. He says, do you realize that you have been chosen by God and he is making you holy and he loves you? Again, that word holy means set apart, that you are unlike the world around you, that God has hand-selected you. He has chosen you. Hey, you are just the throb of his heart. You are his beloved. And as such, he is making you holy. Love that idea. So Paul again says, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, 
Put on, again, it's that language of an, of, of an overcoat. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and graciously forgiving each other whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. Uh, really quick, I just want to kind of walk through each of these words and just kind of give a kind of a broad sense to what Paul is saying here. He starts out with saying, hey, have a heart of compassion. Uh, the word actually is to have bowels of compassion, which is a little awkward in, in our modern context. But again, the, the bowels were the seat of the emotions in Paul's day. Uh, we would say, oh, the Lord has come into your heart, right? In other words, he's not, we're not talking about the, the actual literal heart, the, the, the blood pumping organ. We're talking about the very seat of your emotions, the, the place of your soul. And again, in our context, it's the heart. You know, we sing all the love songs about the heart. Uh, in Paul's day, it was <laughs> all about the bowels. And, oh, you know, when I'm stirred and moved, uh, you're, you're moving my bowels, I guess, is how you, would, <laughs> how you would say it, versus, oh, you've moved my heart. Regardless, Paul says there is a heart, have a heart of compassion, which is this idea of an affection of mercy or compassion or a deep sympathy of another suffering. Paul says put that on, which again is, a, is, a, is an aspect or a clarification, a picture of Jesus. He was the one of compassion and great mercy. He says put on kindness, which is this idea of goodness and kindness, the quality of being warm-hearted, considerate, gentle, generous, and sympathetic. He says put on humility, that word in the Greek is really fascinating. It's this idea of seeing oneself low to the ground. In really, in, or in reality, it's really just seeing others more important as oneself. So even just look at these first three. Paul is saying, hey, put on this overwhelming heart of compassion. If you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ, then there should be this overwhelming compassion and kindness in your disposition to the people around you. That your life should be marked by humility. Now, we're not talking about be a doorstop. We're not saying think you know, of yourself less, uh, or thinking of yourself less, like, oh, I'm a horrible person, I'm no good. It's not that idea, it's you just don't think about yourself. So, hey, would you, would you focus your eyes on Jesus, and as such, would you let him turn your gaze outward to the world around you? Would you be full of compassion and kindness to those around you? Don't think highly of yourself, think highly of Jesus. Think highly of those around you, and think of yourself low to the ground. Paul continues, and he says, put on gentleness, which is a, this idea of acting in a manner that is mild or even tempered or unruffled by circumstances. The idea is often this idea of you, you, you respond in the opposite manner than how you normally naturally want to. He says, put on patience, uh, which is that great word for endurance or steadfastness, uh, that you can endure great pain or unhappiness or difficulty, and no matter, no matter that pressure that is being put upon you. He says, bear with one another, which means to hold each other up, to endure and be patient with. And then he says to graciously forgive one another. In other words, be extravagant with forgiveness and don't hold things over one another. Could you imagine what a group of people would look like if they had these attributes? If you had compassion and kindness and humility and, and, and gentleness and patience and we bore with one another and we forgave one another, I think we'd have to call that group a church because we are just overwhelmingly showcasing the life of Christ to one another. So here's the question. Does that list define my life? When someone thinks of you, do, do they think of someone who is full of compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience and humility? Or do they think of someone who's all wrapped up in themselves and, and actually don't care about the concern and the needs of the people around them? See, what would it look like to so put on the Lord Jesus Christ that his life and his love and, and his character defines my own? It is interesting that Paul ends with that list, in, in that list, that idea of forgiveness. He says, graciously forgive one another. And, and he continues and he says, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. Uh, it, it's interesting, if you look at that same passage in Ephesians, Paul says it this way. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Do you know how God has forgiven us? God has forgiven us extravagantly. That he doesn't keep count. He doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That he's constantly willing to forgive us. Wouldn't it be interesting if we had that same 
mindset with those around us, that we weren't keeping tally marks of offenses. We weren't just, you know, we wouldn't see somebody and go, oh, I remember that one time they did such and such. A da, 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 da. And we just live in bitterness and anger. Wouldn't it be amazing if we truly forgave the people around us in the same manner that Christ has forgiven us, which is extravagantly? One of my mentors once said that no one will ever hurt us as much as we have hurt and offended God. In other words, I, I have shaken my fist in his face and, and I have rebelled against the laws of God. And yet he, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And if that is true of our precious Savior, how much, or in a, in a like manner, maybe I should say it that way, <clears throat> in a like manner, shouldn't we also forgive those around us that they may be shaking their fists in our faces and they may have hurt us in, with great pain, and yet we are called to forgive just as our Lord Jesus forgave us. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw a group of people who were living with these attributes, that would be insane. And again, I think we just have to call that group a church. Does that define you? I don't, I'm not asking if it defines your church. I'm saying, does it define you? Because if this is ever going to define our churches, if this is ever going to define the body of Christ globally, then it has to first start in our lives. So am, am I a man, or if you're a woman, a woman, are you a, are you a person of great compassion? Are you a person of kindness and humility and gentleness and patience? Do you bear with one another? Do you put up with the weight of the people around you? And do you graciously, overwhelmingly, extravagantly forgive the people around you just as the Lord forgave you? Now, if the list stopped there, that, it's, that seems impossible outside of actually putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that is Paul's point. That we cannot do this outside of the reality of Christ within us. Which is why we must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is why Jesus, this is all about the, that grand mystery that we talked about many sessions ago back in chapter 1. It's all about Christ being in you. That the reality is the God of the universe has come to indwell your life through his Holy Spirit. And, and that is the only way that we'll ever be able to measure up and live this kind of a life. But Paul continues this list and he says this, above all. So look what he says in verse 14. Above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. He says, above all these things, and hey, these are important. Hey, you're commanded to put these on. But most importantly, don't forget to put on love. Love is the greatest of the commandments. Love, as Jesus says, is the fulfillment of all the commandments. If, if you want to summarize the entire Old Testament, if you want to summarize all the law of God, Jesus said, just love. Love God and love your neighbor, and that will, that will hey, you will complete. You will, you will obey the law. Isn't it interesting that one of the words that does not <laughs> define the local culture, I mean, especially in the world, but even in the church, is love. That we just, we put up with people, maybe, but we don't have a genuine heart love for those around us. And when you look at the word love in Scripture, love is always giving. It's not receiving. Love is always about meeting the needs of the people around you. It's not about what I can get. Love is all about, oh, you and not about me. In fact, as you know the great popular passage, but in 1 Corinthians 13, listen to how Paul defines love and see if this actually defines our lives. Paul says this, love is patient. Love is kind and it is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. It, love does not, is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness. But love does rejoice with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. D does that list define your life? If you were to substitute the name or the word love for your name, does that still make sense? Because it's true about Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus suffers long. But that's really hard if I put my name in there. Is Nathan patient? Is Nathan kind? Does Nathan suffer long? What about you? Does this list define you? And if not, is it possible that we need Jesus? Again, I, I am convinced that I, I cannot bring about this reality, anything on this list, especially love, outside of him. Yeah, I may be able to show kindness and 
and I'm able to fake the love for a season. But the reality is, is I cannot love without having the one who is love itself living inside of my life. See, I am to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and when Jesus is that which I put on, if he is the essence, if he's the very center of my life, if, if I am full of his spirit, shouldn't the very nature and the character of Jesus flow out of my life? And Paul says, hey, hey, put all these things on. Put on compassion, put on kindness, put on gentleness, put on humility. But hey, don't forget to love. I think sometimes in our culture, we, we get so wrapped up in doing the things that we forget about the motive of why we do the thing. And I hear Paul is saying, don't forget the motive of love. Make sure that you are doing it with a heartfelt, honest, genuine love and care. Again, it's not focused on me, it's focused on you. And Paul says that love is the bond of unity. It's that, it, the word in the Greek is this idea, of it's the cord that ties something together. Wouldn't it be neat if the church, the body of Christ, was all tied together because of love? Jesus says that you will know my disciples by love. Is that true in your life? Again, if this is ever going to be defined, if this is ever going to be true in the global church, it has to first start in our lives. Well, I, I love what Paul does in, in verse 15 as he continues. He talks about this idea of presiding peace. He says this in verse 15, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. That word for rule, that the peace is to rule in your heart, it means to control or to judge or to decide. It's interesting that word in the Greek is an athletic term, and it literally means to preside at the games and distribute prizes. And when you look back at history, how the word was used, it often referred to the judges, or what we'd probably call in our modern day like an empire or a referee, who would reject contestants who aren't qualified and would disqualify those who broke the rules. So in, uh, in other words, if you watch the Olympics, it's interesting. They have to take tests, and if you break the rules, pss, hey, you're, you're disqualified. Hey, you're kicked out. Uh, if, if you're not able to meet a certain level, pst, hey, you're, you're, you're not able to compete. And the word here for rule is that idea. Think about what Paul's saying. That the peace of God, and, and we know from Ephesians 2.14 that Jesus himself is our peace. So the peace of God, Jesus, is going to be the one who judges and controls and decides and, and protects in our lives. It, it, the peace of God is only going to go through your life and go, see that? Hey. That can't be here. See that? Hey, that's disqualified. See that? Woo! That's correct. And not only does it put the limitations and the boundaries of our lives, I love the idea that it also not just presided, it, it oversaw the games, but it also distributed the prizes. Do you know what the prize is that we gain when our hearts are ruled by love or by, by peace? It's Jesus. He is the prize itself. So it's Jesus who's the one who oversees and judges, but he's the prize itself that we get. It's an incredible idea. So Paul says, again, get, get the flow of this, that the Lord Jesus has radically changed your life. He's transferred you from the kingdom of darkness and brought you into his own kingdom. So therefore, anything that looks like the world, you are to bring to death. You are to slay that selfishness, that you are to really take to the undertaker anything of that selfish, lustful, worldly propensity that we all grow up with. Well, if I'm to throw that off like an overcoat and, and I'm, I'm to throw that away and I'm to get rid of that, well, what should mark my life? Jesus, who is the king of that kingdom. And his life and his attributes and, and his attitude should be my own. And above all, hey, I, I need to be marked by love. And Paul says, think about this. The peace of God is really going to be in the middle of all this. And the peace of God, Jesus himself, is going to rule and dictate your life. I don't know about you, but we desperately, desperately need that in the days in which we live. And if you've ever wanted peace, oh, if you've ever wanted to be marked by love, you cannot do it outside of the one who is love and peace itself. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on, says Paul, and throw off everything else. Now, as we get into the last two verses of the, of the section here, Paul makes this concept or gives this idea of what goes in must come out. And so look at Colossians 3.16. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. Do you hear what Paul is saying? He says, oh, may the word of God dwell in you richly, not just to reside, but to reside in you richly. Do you reside richly? Do you dwell in the word of God? We're we're talking about the word of God in text, the scriptures, but also the word of God in person, Jesus. Do you just delight yourself in Jesus? Are you just constantly getting into the word? Are you finding that there's a great love and passion in the word of God? Not just for information. This isn't a you know, a chapter a day keeps the devil away. This isn't like, well, I'll, I'll read through the passage and, and I'll check it off and I'll do some underlining and I'll, I'll go about my day. Does the word of God dwell in you richly, abundantly is the word. Do you just delight yourself in Jesus and his word? And if you find yourself going, eh, I sort of do it if I have to, maybe on Sundays, can I encourage you? Maybe what you need is to have a fresh encounter of the spirit of God in your life. Because what I've found is it's like a good love relationship. See, I, I've never looked at a junior higher or a high schooler or a college student uh, and said, hey, uh, hey, you're dating someone. Uh, would you think about her? And the guy's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Yeah, would you, do you discipline yourself and do you grit your teeth and you, you, you try to, you, you, know, you, you, you know, you spend your 10 minutes and you think about her for the day. He's like, what are you talking about? I, I can't stop thinking about her. In fact, the more I think about her, the more I want to think about her, the more I want to spend time with her and just, oh, I just love. See, wouldn't it be neat to have that with Jesus? Where it wasn't a grit your teeth and discipline yourself to spend time in the word and spend time in prayer and, and, and to delight in him. Rather, it was this overwhelming consumption where I just, I just can't contain myself. I just, I just, I got to be in the word. I just got to be in his presence because, wow, the more I know him, the more I get to, the more I love him, the more I love him, the more I get to know him, the more I get to know him. Oh, the more I love him, I just can't stop. So if you find that your whole spiritual life is more discipline and duty, maybe, maybe you need to have an encounter with the real thing. Maybe, maybe there are some things in your life that you need to put off. And, and if you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find a great affection and love for him and his word. Would you go after Jesus and, and not just dabble in him, not just tip your hat to him, not just the chapter day keeps the devil away kind of stuff. Would you allow the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. Wouldn't it be neat if you were like a fish in in the oceans of his word and you were just breathing in the word, you were just pondering the word, you were just meditating upon the word all the time? That, I think, is God's heart and desire for us, that he wants to be in our mind. David says, oh, I ponder your word day and night in the Psalms. See, is that true in our lives? See, please don't hear that and go, well, I I guess I better discipline myself and I better buckle down. I better pull this thing off. That's not what we're talking about. (laughs) We're not talking about more discipline. And we we mentioned this back in chapter two when we're talking about the false teaching. See, you, you cannot discipline yourself into the spiritual life. You need an overwhelming encounter with the God of the universe. So if you find that the word of God is not dwelling in you richly, well, ask God for it. Spend some time in, the, in prayer before you get into the Word and say, God, as I, as I come into your Word in text, oh, would you, would you make this come alive? Lord, as I spend time in prayer, may, may I not just be going through the motions and may I not just be doing the five-minute thing before, you know, or before bed or the, you know, the 30 seconds before a meal. Lord, somehow can I have an encounter with your presence? And as I delight myself in you, oh, would you just oh, satisfy the depths of who I am and make me know you more. See, that, oh, that is my heart's passion. And, and that I am so convinced is Paul's overwhelming heart in the book of Colossians. Hey, would you just get wrapped up in Jesus? Hey, would you make him first place in every area of your life? Hey, would you just go get crazy and obsessed with Jesus? Oh, I want that for you. So Paul says, hey, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then he goes on and says, hey, that which has been deposited within you, hey, the word of God that is dwelling in you richly, would you allow that to come out of you? And it says, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. So all that dwelling in the word, all that has been deposited within your life, would you let that as a wellspring flow up in and out of you 
And with wisdom, would you teach and admonish and encourage and sing and just woo each other in the Word of God? Hey, would you just keep everyone's focus? Hey, would you just be a constant encouragement? Would you just be a constant finger pointing to the realities of Jesus Christ? So as I dwell in the Word and as as I just spend time in the presence of God, would you allow that to bubble forth and like a volcano explode out of your life so that everyone around you, you're just like, whoa, look at Jesus. Whoa, look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. Man, I'm just, I'm learning this in the Word today. I mean, God's just changing my life and And whether it's through songs and hymns and spiritual songs, or whether it's through wisdom and teaching and admonition, hey, would you just be a constant mouthpiece and declaration of all that God has been doing and depositing within your very life? Oh, that would be phenomenal. Could you imagine what our churches would look like if you had a whole group of people who were not thinking about themselves? Hey, they weren't concerned about the inward stuff. Rather, they were just turning outward and saying, hey, how can I meet your needs? And, and how, how can I just love on you? And they're just marked by graciousness and kindness and purity and, and patience and humility. Man, love was just flowing all over the place. And every person you encountered was just an encouragement. They were exhorting you to press more into Jesus Christ. Again, what would you call a group like that? I think we'd have to call them the church. See, I, I am not interested in just doing church stuff. I am interested in gathering with a group of people who have a passion for Jesus and that the love and the life of Jesus would just spill forth out of everything that we did. Well, Paul in verse 17 finishes with this idea of whatever you do. And he says this in verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul says, just as a summary statement, whatever you do, which would include everything. (laughs) Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Uh, If you've hung out with me, I've often talked about that idea of the name. And it's more than just a name. The idea of a name biblically is the character and the attribute and the characteristics of an individual. So when when we're talking about the name of Jesus, we're not just saying, oh, in the name of Jesus, amen, kind of stuff. Uh, This isn't a stamp that we put on the end of a prayer What we're talking about when we mention the name of Jesus is the character, the nature, the heart, the attributes of who he is. So Paul says, in whatever you do, whether it's word or in deed, every single thing that you do should be done out of this position of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because my life is marked by Jesus, everything that I do should be marked by his character and his nature and his attitude. In short, when someone encounters my life, Though I am not Jesus, they should encounter Jesus because Jesus lives in and through me. And everything that I do, whether it's word or in deed, everything I should do, everything that's coming out of my life, everything that comes out of my lips should be a reflection of the very life of Jesus. Is that true in you? Is it true that whatever you do, whether you, what you say or how you live, is marked by the life of Jesus? I love what Ian Thomas, he was this old preacher back from England, and he once made this statement, he said that the reality of the Christian life is that you become mistaken for Jesus. That that somehow the only explanation for your life becomes Jesus. Wouldn't it be interesting if when someone encountered you, they they saw how you lived and they saw how you talked and they, they saw how you loved they, they saw how you engaged. They, they saw your peace in the midst of chaos. They saw your joy in the midst of hardship. They, they, they saw your, your, your resolute hope in the midst of the, the craziness of the culture. And wouldn't it be fascinating if they could not describe and explain your life because, of, because you're smart or because you're talented or because of your education or because of your upbringing or whatever it may be for you. But rather, the only explanation for your life would be Jesus. See, that is the reality of Christianity. Would you put off everything that doesn't look like Jesus? Would you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that defines him? Hey, would you allow the word of God to dwell in you richly and that which he has deposited within you, would you let that explode out of your life to those around you? And whatever you do in word or deed, would it be done not out of discipline, not out of duty, but because you're so full of his presence, 
that the very Spirit of God dwells in your life, that you just can't help yourself, but the very life and the love and the character and the nature of Jesus just spills forth out of you so that the only explanation for your life would be him. Oh, I want that, and I want that for you. Pray with me. Lord, we need that. Lord, we are desperate for that. Oh, Lord, we live in a day and age where there's not much difference between the people in the world and the people in the church. But Lord, the reality of the kingdom of heaven is that there should be a radical, easily identifiable difference between those who are in the kingdom of darkness and those who are in the kingdom of the beloved Son. Lord, I pray that you would put your finger afresh on anything in our lives that we are to put off, that we are to remove, that looks like the world that should not be a part of our lives. And Lord, as Paul is exhorting us in this passage, may we put on anything and everything that looks like you. Lord, make us people of compassion and kindness and patience and humility and people who bear with one another and forgive one another. Oh Lord, may our lives be marked by love. Lord, would you give us a hunger and a passion and a thirst for your word? And may your word, both in text and in person, dwell in us us richly, and that which you have deposited within us, that which dwells within us richly, may that bubble forth as a volcano out of our lives, and may we encourage and exhort those around us. And Lord, I pray that whatever we do, whether it be through our life or through our lips, may it be done unto your name, according to your character and your nature. Or as Paul would say in Romans eleven thirty six, for from him and through him and to him are all things for your glory. Lord, may our lives be from you and through you and to you for your glory alone. And Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory, not out of our own righteousness, not because of our own discipline or duty, but because your life dwells richly within us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in your precious, powerful name. Amen.